Welcome to this week's edition of Debriefing the Law. I am Joel Oster. I am Chris Marone. And I want to talk about what you are doing during this time of year. This is spring break for us here in the Midwest. And so we are trying to stay warm, trying to go places like where you are, where we can (laughs) be warm. But first, we have to pay the bills. And so this podcast is brought to you by Comedian of Law, the provider of CLEs that educate and entertain. We call it edutainment. Chris, how are you doing on my, my trademark, my copyright for that phrase? I, I'm actually attending and speaking at an IP conference today. So there you go. We I am learning all about trademarks and how to get this edutainment going. And we are gonna we are gonna by the end of this year. It's gonna we be have trademarks. learned now science. Yeah. I know we're all about about the science now with COVID. It's all follow the science. The follow science. the science. Well, the science tells us conclusively that lawyers learn ten percent more when awake than when asleep. Just ten percent. Well, you know what? It's still lawyers, and they're still doing other things. You know, they're checking out Facebook. They're checking out ESPN. Today is the is the tournament, so they're watching the March Madness. But oh, that yeah, being said, upset. exactly. So, uh, hey, you know what? You, you, edutainment, you can learn and mm-hmm. have fun at the same time, and so that's what we do. Also, uh, please give if you like this podcast and you're one of our faithful listeners. Please give us a five-star review. We need those stars to help us get to the next level, so we do appreciate any kind of love you can throw our way. That being said, Chris, it's spring break here in the Midwest, and just last week, we had a snow day. Now, have you ever had a snow day during your spring break out there in Scottsdale? You're not in Scottsdale, but in Phoenix, Arizona? Uh, We, so Flagstaff has snow days because they're about two hours north of us, but I, in my life, in my 40 years of being on this planet, I have never experienced a snow day. Really? Not once. You've never lived up north. Never lived up north. I've never lived in this. I did some years in Washington, D.C., but I'd always seem to be traveling when um, snow days were happening in the DMV area. So wow. I've never once in my life had a snow anything other than a, a snowman. I don't know if I should be envious or, or, or pity you because like I tell you, as a kid... And oh, as yeah. an adult, whenever you get a snow day, it's just like your heart is filled with all kinds of joy. It's like, oh, yes, now we get to stay home and play in the snow for one day. And I can tell you, no one enjoys that more than my two golden doodles. I can't even of say course. that word now without just some kind of sense of dread and awe and shame. But I have two <laughs> golden doodles. And it snowed last week. And, man, do they ever love that snow. They get out there. They stick their schnozzle whatever their nose into the, the snow, throw it everywhere. They just play end on in out there in the snow. Uh, but that's what we do during spring break. Apparently we build a snowman. Uh, but now here's the thought. Have you ever taken a week off during your spring break just to stay home and do nothing? I think they call those days staycation. Are you the staycation type or do you have to go somewhere? So, over the summer, here's pro tip for people coming to Arizona. Over the summer, because it's so hot here, all the hotels drop their prices to like 25 30 bucks a night at the resorts. Really? So my wife and I will often, in early to mid-August, when it's the hottest here in Arizona, we'll go on a staycation to like the Biltmore Resort or right. the Scottsdale Princess, and we'll pay $20, $25 a night. Nice. And have full access to the resort. And nobody comes and visits. Nobody wants to be in Arizona when it's 120 degrees, which is smart. Don't don't think for a second that that's a dumb idea. But then we get to go to the resort pools and we get all these packages and there's shows and all this stuff. So we'll do the staycation during the summer. I but see. during our spring breaks, man, we're, we're out. We're, we're going to go up to the mountains. We're going to go camping. We're going to go hiking. We're going to go do something else. I wanted to go someplace, but we just got two puppies, the golden doodles, so we had to stay here. Couldn't go anywhere with them. Goodness, those were still in the middle of potty training, which that's a, a nightmare and a disaster. But nonetheless, we stayed here. So yesterday, we went and watched the Batman, apparently taking cues from The Ohio State University. The producer of this movie decided to name it The Batman. So I just have to ask you, Chris, before we get into the nitty-gritty of the law, are you a superheroes kind of guy when it comes to movies? I really am. I really, okay. really, really enjoy the superhero movies. Okay, so what what kind of superheroes do you enjoy most? The kind that at least 
give some kind of effort to make it appear realistic. And I know it's superheroes. It's not going to be right, realistic. Right, right. But you, there's a difference between the Batman, which I just saw, which tried right. to make things look normal if they can, as compared to the Adam West Batmans of years gone <laughs> by, you know, where the cabal and the shit, whatever. The those gone era. Yeah. Or the Danny DeVito playing the penguin who actually looked like a penguin and squawked like a right. penguin. No, none of that here. The penguin in the Batman was just some rough mafia looking guy. And if you looked at him, yeah, he kind of looked like a penguin's kind of face, but clearly he was just a mafia guy. And so yeah. what kind of superhero movies do you like? The kind that at least try to make it seem realistic? There's, So I am a huge fan of the Netflix Marvel series, Daredevil, Punisher, Jessica Jones, um, not Iron Fist, but The Defenders. I really, really enjoyed those series, mainly because they were like 10 episodes, 12 episodes. You right. can really get into the story. I did also enjoy like Endgame. I enjoyed the Marvel Infinity Wars. I enjoyed the Infinity Saga with Iron with RDJ being over the top with Iron Man. I thoroughly loved it. But to be honest, Charlie Cox playing Daredevil is like by far my favorite superhero adaptation of all of it. Hence why I'm in red, as a matter of fact. That's, there you go. That's such a good leeway. Look at that. All right. Well, uh, hey, we are in the middle of March Madness, and we're going to end this podcast by talking about the March Madness tournament because I am a huge basketball fan. I find these two days, the first two days of the tournament, to be the best two days of yes. sports for throughout the entire year. I, I'm just captivated by all the innings. I have like three TV screens up because I have YouTube TV, so you can have them on all your different computers and then your main TV. And I'm watching all the endings of these games, and it was just great. I was up until midnight last night watching <laughs> my beloved KU Jayhawks. But let's talk about that and save that for the end. We got to talk about some legal news first. And even though the Supreme Court took the couple of last couple of weeks off, Apparently, they were also doing a staycation or spring break or whatever oh, yeah. they do there at the Supreme Court. Maybe we should get one of them online and interview them one of these days. Ooh. That would really up our ratings. But nonetheless, <laughs> they have not been in session, but that does not mean the Lady Justice took the week off. There's a lot going on in the world of law. Let's start with this topic. Chris, I want to throw this by you for discussion because a lot of our listeners might not realize this is an issue. What I'm talking right. about is cameras at the U.S. Supreme Court. They have long rejected this idea of broadcasting their proceedings, and they wouldn't even... We're not talking no, not audio broadcasting, not like radio, and they would not do video broadcasting. So you know how like a C-SPAN would, would air congressional hearings yep. live, which is like, wow. Non-stop. Bore, most boring thing ever, but at least it gave an era of transparency. Oh, that's what our congressmen do, our senators right. do. They do yeah. absolutely nothing. I remember watching when they were taking a vote, going, okay, they're voting. How come yeah. no one is in, the, in their seats? Or worse yet, someone is up there speaking, no one is listening. All right, so that's yeah. what Congress does and, and the Senate. But Cameras at the Supreme Court, a huge controversy. They do not allow for it, do not do it. But of course, as you know, during COVID, they had to clock the doors to the Supreme Court. They had to do something. So they decided right. to air their proceedings via Zoom. So you, you could live stream the Supreme Court proceedings. And the issue now is, should they stop doing even that? Chris, what are your thoughts on broadcasting Supreme Court proceedings? I'm all about it. I think part of the reason why we should air the, the reason why C-SPAN works in my opinion is that it allows for transparency for people to see how the sausage is made. And I think that if we aired Supreme, Supreme court cases, we would demystify some of these issues. We've talked several times on this podcast about how certain issues are procedural versus emotional, right? We talked last week about, um, abortion. We've talked about DACA. We've talked about, um, uh, executive orders, all of which are very procedural. So if people are allowed to see how that procedure is being done, how the justices are talking, and also, I mean, I think that's a good thing. And, and to second to that is, I mean, it's it's a fairly decent 5-3 split. I'm not counting Breyer anymore because he's on his way out. You can see how people who are ideologically opposed can still have a constructive discussion 
through opposing viewpoints, and it's not soundbite from your favorite news station, soundbite from my favorite news station, and that's what we consider to be what's going on at the Supreme Court. All I right. think more exposure is a lot better than less exposure. So you are out there for, hey, let's have more transparency in government. Now, let me give the other side, and I'm not sure yes. which side I fall on, but let me just, since you stated one side, let me give mm-hmm. the other thought, which probably would be held by the likes of Scalia and probably even John Roberts, the Chief Justice probably. John Roberts, and that is this. The justices themselves guess what this they're, they're human just like everyone else they like the limelight and so because they are human if they know that their proceedings are going to be broadcasted and actually have video on the evening news they're going to have this desire to have the 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 lead you know bit the quip that runs on the uh, the mm-hmm. the headline news you know leads off the evening news uh like like an ESPN sports center right uh, the ESPN likes to show these these vicious oh, yeah. hits there. And so these players would do certain things on the field or on the court just because they know that would get them on a sports center, get them the a little bit of real. pub, you know, things like that. So the, the Supreme Court justices, they're no different. They love the limelight. They want to lead off of the ESPN Sports Center with their plays of the week. And so no, because of that, there might be less meaningful dialogue and more Maybe. just real short snippets of, of digs and, and really great yeah. sound bites that would sound great leading yeah. off the evening news. So does that change your mind at all? Kind of, but not really. Um, you know, we, I don't know. I think, it, I think it's outweighed by the fact that transparency is much more important. But I do see uh, a comp- if Clarence Thomas would have been silent in the age of recording for how many years he didn't ask right. a question? What was it like? Fifteen years he didn't ask a question on the Supreme Court. That would be quite the like compilation of just like <laughs> silence, silence, right. silence from you know, you know, call him silence, do good or something to that effect. Right, like, right. Old Ben Franklin name, but um, I still think we need to have it for transparency. I do not think we need to have it on the lower courts, kind of like we discussed yesterday. But I do think that at the Supreme Court level, their lifetime appointments they should not have political you know, gaze in them. That's at least what we tried to say for the court is that it's a a political body and we just want to make sure that they're out there, you know, interpreting the constitution. Now, why is it different when you're talking about local trial courts? Why do you think that's different? Because prosecutors are politicians. They rerun every so often. They have to get reelected. Same thing with local judges. It's not a lifetime appointment. So if you're putting cameras in the courtroom, you're essentially creating a political rally every single trial right. for that prosecutor or for that judge. So I, in my work in criminal defense, you know, discretion is key, right? If we can, if we know the case is a loser, but it's a high profile case, or if we know that the prosecution knows that the case is a loser, but it's high profile, there's, way we, there's ways we can all work together to make it a win-win for everyone. But if you put cameras in the courtroom, every prosecutor, every time has to get up there and grandstand because we all like to pretend that we're tough on crime and want to make sure that that image is put out there for prosecutors and judges. All right. So basically what I just said about the U.S. Supreme Court, magnify that by 100 when it comes to your local courtroom, your local prosecutors, your local DAs, your local judges who run for election. They might be very concerned about what the public is going to see because let's face it. The public is not going to watch. Generally speaking, right. it's going to be like C-SPAN. It's going to be crickets right. out there until you mess up. And that will be replayed forever and ever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Randy Travis. All right. So that's cameras at the Supreme Court. We'll be watching that right now because the Chief Justice is considering stopping the live streaming of Supreme Court right. arguments. And so we'll have to see which way they go. All right. Also in the news, and this really caught my attention, Jesse Smollett, Jesse Smollett, his conviction is in real jeopardy. It is. P- uh, pun intended here, because of double jeopardy. Here's what happened. The DA Fox was her name. You remember at the very beginning, they were, everyone was up in arms over what Jesse Smollett did. Uh, he staged this fake crime, and the police chief thought it was just horrendous. It wasted police resources. It cast doubt as to every legitimate claim that is out there. He said, we have got to stop this, and this is, this is a horrible uh, crime, and we must punish him to the fullest extent of the law. So the police right. was all up in arms. The public 
was all up in arms. Well, you mm-hmm. had this DA Fox who thought, well, maybe there were some backroom deals there. She did not want to put Jesse Smollett right. behind bars. And so this is what she said. She said, I'm not going to prosecute that. Just right. forfeit your bail, and then we will just move forward, and we're going to dismiss this case. All right, well. Once the public got wind of that, they said, wait a second here. This is absolutely fraudulent. This is rife with all kinds of, of backroom dealings. Everything that we fear about you know, uh, uh, fraud in the law and corruption in the law, this is it. Not prosecuting this kind of case. So a special right. prosecutor was appointed, and that special prosecutor said, no, I can bring charges. And they did. And they convicted Jesse Smollett of, what, five of the six counts of right. filing of fake police reports. All right, well, it went up on appeal now. And in a two-to-one decision, the appellate court said, hey, while we are considering this appeal, we're going to let Jesse go. He is going to be right. a free man. Chris, what do you take right. of all of this? Our system's broken. I think right right off the bat, I think it's an easy that's an easy softball pitch, right? The criminal justice system has issues from the get-go. Um is this unheard of? Not at all. I've been personally involved in deals that are very similar to this where, um, and, and my, my best example is I had a guy who was accused of stealing a football Jersey. Uh, okay. We'll use Mahomes because I love the Kansas city chiefs hat. Right. That's right. right. For those so, of you not watching, but listening, I have a Kansas city chiefs helmet behind me and my beloved Nebraska Cornhuskers. One is a little bit of trouble. We need some help. Go, go indeed, on, Chris. Indeed. But the Mahomes jersey would be worth something, whereas a Nebraska jersey, yeah. eh, maybe, depends. Um, but serious, so guy was accused of stealing a jersey. DA came back and said, look, I don't care. I don't care. Get the jersey back. If the jersey is back in, in my office by Tuesday, we'll just drop the charges and we'll be done with it. We, we won't even prosecute. We won't even bring this to a court. Just get me the jersey back. Go back to my client say, I, I don't want to hear anything about it. Tomorrow, I just want to have the jersey in my hands. All of this goes away. And 16-year-old kid, this happens a lot. And I know that Jesse isn't a 16-year-old kid, but this is the example. Jersey shows up, gives to the DA. Everything's good. Nothing goes to court. Nobody cares. Now, because he wasn't the DA, the actual district attorney, but a deputy, some other prosecutor could come in and go, hey, we got the jersey back. That means your guy is guilty. This is an easy win for me. I'm going to put this up and we're going to take this kid to court. That creates a problem in the relationships between defense attorneys and prosecutors. Now, for 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 Jesse's case, I, this doesn't go to the level of double jeopardy. Again, procedural issue, right? Double jeopardy means a case has to reach finality. So well, let's analyze that. So we're talking yeah. about double jeopardy. What is double jeopardy? Well, it's rooted in the Fifth Amendment. In the Fifth Amendment right. to the United States Constitution states in part, no person shall be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. So you can't the idea there is is that once you can't be tried twice for the same crime. Now, I right. have found doing this research. There are all kinds of exceptions to that. For example, yes. in 2018 or 19 in Gamble v. U.S., the Supreme Court said eh, that doesn't apply to separate sovereigns. So if you were, right. if you murdered someone, you can be tried in state court, and then if you are yep. found innocent or not guilty in state court, the feds yep. can come in as well and prosecute under federal law because those are Correct. separate sovereigns. Double jeopardy mm-hmm. does not prevent separate sovereigns from punishing you, which I got to say, well, did you not read the fifth amendment? It doesn't seem to have a separate sovereigns exception. It says no person shall be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. I have no idea how the separate sovereigns came about in light of what the fifth amendment says. But uh, again, that's, that's the rule we're talking about. Our constitution says you can be put on trial twice. Chris, there's two issues to this. Well, at least let's just say to start off with two. The first one is when, does double when when does jeopardy actually attach? So when does the proceeding actually begin? Well, there are there are several schools of thought there. One is when the jury is sworn. Another one is when the first witness is sworn. The other yeah. thought is when the court first hears evidence in a juvenile proceeding, or when the court accepts a plea agreement between a defendant and a prosecutor. Right. Chris, in this case, 
there was no jury that was sworn. So I don't yeah. understand the argument of why, because Jeopardy never even attached in the first place. You're not even getting to double Jeopardy. What, what am I missing here? That in appellate law, you throw everything at the wall and you hope something sticks. Okay. All right. Good point. And, and I think, and I think you know, as we've, we, as I've looked at this more, his appellate lawyers are going to throw everything out. Ineffective assistance of counsel, double jeopardy, prosecutor misconduct, whether that actually exists or doesn't, which I don't think it actually does exist. I think that, um, I think that they're just throwing out legal arguments in the hopes that they get something to There's go. Something sticks. Okay. Something sticks. And that, and that's, and that's a good appellate attorney, like full stop. That is a solid appellate attorney trying their hardest to find every creative legal argument they can to get their client the result they're looking for. Now, when I first heard about this argument, my mind immediately went to the Bill Cosby Cosby. conviction because it's a very similar thing. And he went to trial and then he was found guilty. It was thrown out under this idea that, wait a second, the prosecutors said some things early on. You relied upon that. And so then somehow your conviction should be overturned. And we, we right. even talked about how that might have been similar to this factual and legal scenario. I dug mm-hmm. up that opinion and it is entirely different. Now, in that case it dealt with the Fifth Amendment, but another part of the Fifth Amendment, the part that prevents a person from being forced to testify against right. himself, the self-incrimination clause. So in, in that case, the prosecutor, the DA, made some public statements like, we are not going to prosecute him for these crimes, there is no case there. And then in reliance upon those assurances, Bill Cosby went and testified during a deposition. He never would have right. done that. So by saying what he said, that induced Bill Cosby to testify during a, de- a, a civil trial, during a deposition, and then his testimony was used to convict him. That's a Fifth right. Amendment self-incrimination matter, Classic. not a double jeopardy matter. Yeah, that's a classic Fifth Amendment issue where you're using your testimony against you like that is exactly what the framers were wanting to protect against so if we don't have the the self-incrimination here because right. i don't think jesse said anything in reliance right. upon i mean maybe he forfeited his bond but that wasn't used as evidence in this case no. so the, it's not going to be a self-incrimination issue double right. jeopardy is not going to be an issue because jeopardy never attached in the first no. place right. nonetheless the courts might say We just don't like this because of the hypothetical you gave. We don't think the prosecution should be engaging in fraudulent conduct, inducing people to do certain things. We want them to rely upon plea agreements and the beginning stages of them. So maybe this is the appellate lawyers just throwing their arguments against the wall, seeing what sticks, and see what the court does with it. But as we understand the law, this is a non-starter from the beginning. Any final thoughts on that? Well, and I think this is going with a long trend of courts cracking down on prosecutor conduct that we've seen, right? The Bill Cosby one is the classic one that we've seen. You know, for a time, prosecutors could do no wrong, and the deck was stacked to allow them to do things. And we've seen this over time, right? That's why Miranda came out. That's why the Angel Doctrine came out. That's why Gideon came out. Like, we're seeing a lot of, and it's over time, right? Gideon v. Wainwright, we learn about our first year of of law school, like, I was in the 60s, right? Same thing with Miranda v. Arizona, right? All these cases, the court will crack down on, on prosecution and prosecutor misconduct in error in allowing more rights and more um, leeway towards lay people who don't understand the complex nature of law. And I think that this is just another kind of punch to say, you can't make this deal. You can't make these under the table deals to make things go away, no matter how hard or how easy it would be to do your job. You got to do your job. You got to prosecute. And us as defense attorneys, we got to throw out every asinine argument humanly possible, including a double jeopardy claim (laughs) during an appeal. Right, right. Now, for our non lawyer listeners, you might be thinking, well, we, we don't really quite follow what you're saying here. Cops lie all the time. It's called sting operations. It's called undercover. The they engage in deception to get someone to make some kind of confession or to get them arrested. Yeah, there is a difference between the cops and the lawyers. Lawyer. Lawyers under our model ethical rules cannot lie. So, yeah, while the cops can lie to, to entice someone to come someplace to give up, to, to you know, be arrested. Anything, yeah. That's okay, 
but lawyers cannot do the same thing. And so that's why this is a big issue here. I think that this was a wise appeal because who knows what the appellate court might do. They might fashion some new form of promissory estoppel, detrimental reliance. Maybe. Though here, I don't think Jesse Smollett relied upon anything. That's going to be the problem yeah. with that kind of argument. He just accepted it yeah. and then went away. All right, a couple other passing thoughts here on this matter before we, before we leave it. The other thought is that his lawyers are saying, see, look, this shows how Jesse Smollett's rights were violated. Hold on there. No, back up. That's not what this is doing here. Mm. He still did it. He committed the crime. He got off. You know, if you did not have this conviction, this this second trial, he would have right. got off scot free, and he should have been right. convicted. He should have faced a trial. The crime that he did it makes the judicial system a mockery, and and so he he discredited every legitimate race based claim or sex based claim that's out there by doing a fake fraudulent one. So his lawyers, I think, shame on you for trying to say that your client was somehow maligned during this process no he committed the crime he should pay the time all right for sure for sure now let's move on to also in the legal news uh Brittany griner a former Ooh. player for baylor we're in the middle of the the, the march yep. madness and so i believe she won the ncaa title for baylor she there she is a great woman's a basketball player plays in the wnba mainly because that's the most prestigious basketball league out there for women. Now, it's not yes. the most highest paid, but because it has Old NBA as a part of the name, it's the most prestigious. So in order to actually make real money, I think she makes like $200,000 a year during the WNBA, she plays overseas, and she plays mm -hmm. in Russia, in the Russian league, and makes yep. about a million dollars a year. All right. Right. As she was going through the she security plays for the Phoenix there. Mercury. Just a just a shout out. She plays here locally for the Phoenix Mercury. Amazing I, player. I did not make that connection. She All does. Right. She plays she's, here. She's local for you. She is. Has she reached out to you to be her lawyer? Uh, no, because she's smart. Okay, all right. Or or because she's trapped in Russia and she can't make phone calls to the United States. Who knows? She didn't save your number. Well, whatever. She, uh, it's not tattooed. <laughs> And so um, she's over there and as while she's going through security, she had a I'm going to butcher this, but you're going to get the idea. She had a vape cartridge that had mm -hmm. oil residue that somehow that oil residue came from marijuana. And so she was detained because marijuana is illegal there in, in allegedly, Russia. Allegedly, allegedly had a vape cartridge, allegedly alleged marijuana or hashish in it. Now we can imagine in America if you are, you wouldn't even be stopped for that. Let's just be honest and frank. But let's just say you are stopped, you're, you're not going to be detained. The law enforcement might arrest you if it's a violation of the laws in that jurisdiction. You are not going to spend one minute in jail. Yeah. You're going to be released uh, on your own recognizance and said, "Come back in." You're going to be given a diversion. That's how the law works in America, but not so. In foreign <laughs> countries. And so here she has been detained now for several months. Sources say that she has been, they've been in contact with her, but really it, it's a secret. No one really knows where she is. And she is facing a real dire predicament. Of course, while this is going on, Russia decides to bomb Ukraine and the United States decides to arm the Ukrainians in this war against Russia and is Brittany Griner caught in the middle. Any thoughts on this international legal trouble over a vape pen that allegedly might contain some marijuana oil residue? It's, it's sad. I mean, at the end of the day, it's super sad. It's, I mean, Brittany one should have known if she had it. I, I can't I can't speak to whether or not she had it or not. I can't speak to whether or not this is trumped up charges by the Russian government being Russia because it's Putin and it's the government and it's the bombing of Ukraine and they want to have a bargaining chip for the United States. I don't know if it has, falls into diplomatic issues. Um, what I do know is that you should know better going into another country. You should know that your your rights and your freedoms that we are our I should say our rights and our freedoms that we enjoy under the the stars and stripes does not extend very far. And and though we are friends with Mexico and Canada, you still can't do certain things that you can do here in America that you can do in Mexico and Canada. There, get arrested in Mexico and see how quickly your rights are. 
right available to you it's not the same legal system not you're not owed the all. same due process rights and, and so right. some things you might think are legal here in america might be illegal and here's the thing yeah. just because you're an american citizen does not nothing. give you a pass in a foreign jurisdiction you are still going to be held liable under those laws and so if right. you can uh, possess the substances that are illegal in that country you're going to be held subject to right. that crime right. in that foreign country and here's the deal. They're not going to want to just let you go because if they let you go, everyone knows what you're going to do. You're going to hop on the first plane out of there. You're going to head to the right. United States where you are no longer subject to their laws. And so mm -hmm. it's a real dire situation. This reminded me of the Amanda Knox trial. You remember what happened to right. Amanda Knox? She was this uh, lady from Seattle, uh, Washington, mm -hmm. and she wanted to study abroad, went over to Per per Peru, uh, Italy. They're out mm -hmm. uh, close to Rome. Yeah. And while there, her roommate was murdered. And yep. and they pretty soon suspected that Amanda did it. And why do they suspect Amanda did that murder? Because her mannerisms did not comport to how they think a mm -hmm. lady should act. For example, they right. said, oh, she was making out with her boyfriend right after she discovered the dead body. Chris, I saw the video. She was not making out with her boyfriend. She was there totally distraught. You can see it all over her face in the embrace right. of her boyfriend, sure. And they were right. kissing, but it wasn't like one of these make out kisses. It was that you're going to be all right. We're going to get through right. this kind of kiss. It's a totally different right. thing. It's like how you might kiss your mother on the side of the cheek, though I don't know about that, but no, you get the idea. It was not oh, yeah. a romantic kiss. And, and so, but she did that. The Italian forces thought, oh, that those are the actions of a guilty person. She spent right. four years in jail there in Italy for that crime, until she was exonerated, and then took the got the first flight out of there and came right back to Seattle, right. where she was no longer subject to their laws. And so, are right, any other words of advice for your um, star forward there, Brittany Griner? Just keep your head down. Um, I, I can't. We all know like Russian gulags. Like we can, we, we have an image of what Russian prison looks like. We have an image of what we think being detained in Russia right now. And it's not Martha Stewart's middle class country club when she got right. indicted for, for tax fraud, right? Or for insider trading. This is, I, I, I worry because one, we're in the middle of this international incident. If, if we, if Russia was not invading Ukraine, it may be a whole different situation of negotiations and getting her out and slap on the wrist. But because we're in the middle of a war, not us personally, but us personally, because there's a war going on right now that we're heavily vested in. She could be there for years. Right. And I, I fear that she'll get forgotten because she's the lone basketball player and we're trying to help out the Ukraine. And, uh, and she, yeah, so you'd be very careful traveling yeah. internationally. Uh, you can't just call up your American yeah, lawyer and your family. American lawyer will not be able to get you out of it. All right. Lastly, in legal news, before we get to our courtroom quarterback segment, which mm -hmm. we're probably going to have to change that name eventually, because we're going to be talking about non-football things a small portion of the time. But nonetheless, also in big, big legal news, I mean, earth is shattering legal news. The Senate passed. Uh, this bill to make daylight savings time the permanent way of life in America. Now, Chris, uh, are you sitting down? You're not sitting down. Are you sitting down or are you standing? No, I'm at a standing desk. Wow, that's impressive. All right, just I, realize yeah. you don't look like you're sitting down. You are standing no. up doing this podcast. That's right. Get that Wait. blood flowing. I can be ready to juke at any time, man. I am ready to do this. I'm do you work all day in a standing position? I try to. I try at least four hours a day. That's why you stay in such good shape. All right. Well, nonetheless, um, I just I don't I don't want you to, to fall or anything. But the Senate passed this bill, which is going to make a daylight savings time permanent, one hundred right. to zero. It was a it was a Christmas miracle in the midst of what March? It's March Madness. That's what when it is. You, it is March Madness in the Senate. When have you ever seen? The, the the Senate vote unanimously on anything, one hundred to zero. I had no idea people were that upset. I didn't think that was possible with the daylight savings. Now, I will say, Chris, you During guys a spring don't break even, week. What's that? During a spring break week. Yeah. Now, wow. how is this going to impact you guys? Because you guys don't even follow daylight savings nope. time at all. I think we'll just be on Pacific time forever now. All right, that's that's a little work. I mean, uh, that's where we're at. 
Yeah, so they right now you're two hours behind. Two weeks ago, you're one hour behind. So whatever right. happened there. So uh, this still has to pass that House, and then the president has to sign it. But apparently, everyone's in a unanimous agreement. Daylight savings time needs to be permanent. We, I guess, value the daylight at the end of the day and don't care if our kids are going to school and standing in the bus line in pitch black darkness. But we'll have to wait and see how that uh, bill actually uh, plays out. All right. Now it's time for courtroom quarterback. Man, let's do this. All right, we are in the middle of March Madness. So let me just start off here by saying how ticked off I am with ESPN. Here's why. We just went through the very first day of March Madness, which to me is my favorite Two days of sports during the entire year. I just love the nonstop action from, for me, 1120 in the morning. It starts till right. midnight. I am watching incredible basketball. I don't even know the teams. I don't even know the players. Right. I just am watching the score. Oh, look, that's five minutes left, and it's a close game. I'm turning on that game. So I'll have three different games on. Of course, I'll have my KU Jayhawks on one of them. I don't care how big the blowout of course, is. no matter what. Um, that being said, do you know what – ESPN would dominate their coverage today on their main sports center program. Baylor football. No. Fo- that's it. Nothing. Now I'm talking about the get up in the morning. How ESPN is their main flagship program in the morning really? for two hours. No, no mission whatsoever of March madness. Why Chris? I can see you're making faces. You're, you, you're confused. I, let me, let me I tell you confused. my theory as to why. ESPN does not carry the basketball games. They don't, they don't they carry don't. it. They don't. CBS does. So why would they promote some other TV program's main tournament? Now, they do carry the women's basketball tournament, and they did talk about the women's March Madness. They did not talk about the men's March Madness program in any significant detail, and I watched pretty much the entire program. Now, I know they have rights to it because I did flip over to SportsCenter, and they did have a couple of highlights from the March Madness games. I know they can play some of the the highlights from the games. So why do they choose not to on their main get up program? ESPN used to be a sports news program. Now it's not. Now they are just promoting their own programming and not actually Mm. what is in sports news. So that was my beef number one, but let's just get to it. I I love March Madness. And I do you think it's a a contractual issue? Do you think maybe, like because CBS owns the, maybe it's CBS CBS or or Fox owns the rights to March Madness because if I remember correctly a few years back and I want to say it was like 2012 2013 so a little more than a few years back ESPN leaked the bracket right before CBS could put the bracket out right so maybe that was part of the settlement agreement or something to that effect that ESPN just lost I don't know that's speculation I cannot see how it hurts. CBS Anybody. one bit to have right. another news station cover the highlights from the game that just generates right. interest in your right. product. And so again, sports center did carry some, some highlights from it. I don't know why they did not um, uh, cover it. If it is a contractual issue, uh, it just, it chaps my hide. CBS does not have mm-hmm. a sports news programming site. So I can't right. go to CBS's news station and watch highlights of March madness. But nonetheless, um, uh, I was not too happy. I guess I got to watch the games. Maybe that's what they want you to do is actually yeah. watch the games. All right. Maybe. Here's the other great thing about March Madness. Everyone will do a March Madness bracket picks. Yep. Did you did you do your picks this year? Of course I did my picks this year. All right. Uh, is it already busted? No. Uh, yes. I mean, obviously with, with uh, St. Peter's victory and Richmond, my, my brackets were busted. All right. But I think my my final four obviously hasn't changed much because well, who, who, who is your final four? final four? My final four: St. Mary's um, is um, um, Gonzaga. I'm pulling up my final four: Arizona, which hurts me to say so bad. And then I'm really gonna have to hit you hard on this one, Joel. But I'm going. I'm I'm, I'm not going with KU. I'm not. I'm going. I'm going with Wisconsin. Wisconsin oh. in my final four. I used to I used to value your opinion. 
We and used to be friends. And we now were. I realize you're just a chump. No, they, um, I am the opposite from you. I, I lag right. any ability to actually evaluate my teams. For, I think 30 years straight now, every bracket I've done, I pick KU as the winner, and then I backtracked from that and filled in all the other games. And so, oh, same, I love this. Same is true this year. My final four, I have – did you really pick St. Mary's? I did. Did I hear I that did. right? I have, I have, I have – um, Personal ties to St. Mary's the same way that you have personal ties to KU. All so right. I did pick St. Mary's. All right. Well, a good win yesterday. Congratulations right. on that. I don't know who they Thank beat. You, I remember watching it, though. Uh, so nonetheless, I pick KU. Baylor, two Big 12 teams. Why? Yep. I'm a Big 12 homer. I love the Big yep. 8 when it merged into the Big 12. I'm a big Big 12 fan, even though they only have 10 teams in the conference. Uh, and so I'm going with Baylor and KU. So Kentucky's okay. loss didn't hurt me that bad. Iowa's loss, I love, because I got to admit, I was Loves afraid it. of them. And I knew we would have to face them or Wisconsin eventually. Uh, yeah. And so that was problematic. I also picked Arizona because everyone else is picking Arizona. And I picked Gonzaga uh, as well. Those are my final four teams. Of course, I have KU cutting down the nets after they beat Baylor in the semifinal game. So who is your national title champion? I don't want to say it out loud. You got it's to. Arizona. Oh, oh my goodness. You pro- Chris, I think your your chancellor is right behind you. He is saying you have been dismissed from ASU. Right. You cannot right. pick your enemy, but hey, you know oh. what? There's a couple reasons here. Look, Arizona is a great team, and I didn't go to I didn't go to U of A. I didn't go to ASU, so I don't have the huge rivalry. But a national championship victory would raise a lot of boats in Arizona in our stock here in Arizona. So it would be a victory um, for the state okay. if Arizona won. All right. And so I look at the global pick. I put aside the rivalry of ASU U of A. Um, and I look to see what is the greater good. And if Arizona wins, um, I win money. So there's that. Um, but secondly, it really does help the state of, of Arizona as a whole. If we bring home a national championship. There you go. All right. That makes sense. I will say if KU cuts down the nets, it will be due in large part to Arizona State University. So I want to give a shout out to you guys. Uh, Remy Martin played for Arizona State University the last couple of years as a great player, transferred to KU just this last offseason. He was actually predicted to be the conference player of the year. He's that good of a player. We never Mm -hmm. saw that because he was injured for most of the season, but we saw glimpses of it. Well, now he is fully healthy. And wow, is he good. Last night, he dominated. He operates at a totally different level. I heard on the the, 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 the broadcast that he is just short of six feet tall. Nonetheless, I saw him do a two-hander slam with emphasis during the game. So that guy has got some leaping ability. And um, hey, I'm all big. uh, Thank you, ASU, for letting us borrow or have Ruby Martin for this one tournament run, and I hope it works out really well. All right. So today I'm going to go back to watching March Madness again. But any, yes. I know there's some things going on out there somewhere else in, in the world of sports. My focus is on March Madness, but there have been some movements in the NFL as well. So, Chris, I'm going to let you update us on what's going on in the NFL. Uh, my favorite part of all of this, hands down, is Devontae. Now, okay. we, we talked last week, Aaron Rodgers signed his $200 million deal, or maybe we right. didn't. I, I, I can't remember how, how we talked we about it. But He's your boy. I, I keep giving you credit. You keep distancing yourself from him, but I know you love him. Yeah. I mean, we're buddies. I hate that guy. Um, but so his number one receiver these past couple of years has been Devontae. And Devontae got traded to the Raiders this week. So Aaron Rodgers got his $200 million contract, but he's got no one to throw to. Well, he has no so, money. There's no money left to, to pay no, anyone. No. They traded Devontae for two premium draft picks. All right. So hopefully they pick up two receivers or Aaron Rodgers is going to be thrown to Aaron Rodgers who's going to run for an Aaron Rodgers touchdown. Now, I here's one of the thoughts about Tom Brady. Uh, and they say that look, Tom Brady historically has mm-hmm. given up money. He has taken less money mm-hmm. to be a quarterback. And they're saying yep. that's not really – on him, that doesn't make him a better quarterback than others. I, I, they, they struggle on how to deal with the fact that Tom Brady intentionally chooses to make less money. Right. 
I think that's brilliant on Tom Brady's part. I really do. I think that has, has elongated his career. He said better talent around him has right. probably made him a better leader in the clubhouse because people right. realize, oh, you took less money so I could get paid. And so right. that kind of leadership, I think, is probably why he's won so many Super Bowls and championships. And right. it does come as an entire package. So you got to give Tom Brady some kudos for that. That being said, that also was big sports news this last week. Apparently, Tom Brady went home, realized, wow, there's a lot of honeydew lists now that I have to do. I got to get back to work here. This is for the, for the birds. And so that was probably the shortest lived retirement I've ever heard of. Why do you retire for two weeks? Do you, I don't understand that. I don't. I don't think he had the intention to retire for two weeks. I thought he was going to do it for the, I, I honestly believe that he was going to go out for the long haul for years. He said he wanted to go out by 45. He wanted to be home and all this stuff. But I think there was a lot of incentives and a lot of people talking to him about coming back. Like he's not, he's not broken. He's not beaten. He's still in peak physical condition. He could still draw big money from any team in the league. He could still be used as a bargaining chip, which we saw because the minute that he announced his retirement, the Bucks signed their wide receiver back to another contract. Right. So I think that, and Brady would be great for a, a solid trade to get the Bucks a more franchise quarterback that's going to stay there for the long haul. And let's face it, so few players. I, I'm just trying to think of it. Can, can I even think of any players? I can think of one player in my mind right now, maybe two. I'm sure right. there's more. But players who are at the absolute top of their game and then walked away. I'm thinking right. of John Elway. No, he was a right. shell of, him, of his former self. I know he won he the Super Bowl, but he was not the same John Elway that we had seen before. Peyton Manning could barely grip a football, let right. alone throw it when he stepped Steve down Young, and retired. Joe Montana, Jerry yeah. Rice. All of them didn't re- retire at the height of their career. Ronnie Lott, yeah. uh, Emmett Smith, Troy Aikman, maybe right. Tony Romo. Reno. The list goes on and on. People right. retire when they can no longer play the play game. The game. Now, again, there are, there are a couple of exceptions that just came to my mind. Barry Sanders was on right. the verge of breaking all rushing records and said, you know what, I'm at the top of my game. I want to step aside. And we all thought, yeah, that that's just, you, you want more money, maybe for a right. year to take a break. You're going to come back. No one retires at the absolute top of their game. Barry Sanders did. Uh, right. uh, Jim Brown. Now, I was not oh, a yeah, Jim, Jim Brown I, fan I, I, Jim back Brown, in the day because yeah. I wasn't even born then. But mm-hmm. during the 60s, apparently he retired at the absolute top of his game. But so few players do it. So it would have been really odd for Tom Brady, who uh, he is at the top of his game. I mean, I've seen his right. passes. I hate to say it because I cannot stand the guy. He can right. still throw a rope. And you can say, well, yeah. Joel, he's lost a step. He is slow. Uh, newsflash, he's always been slow. I mean, right. <laughs> the, his not, speed has never been a part of his game. And so that's not going to hurt him for losing right. a step. And I think, yeah, I mean, why why do you go out when you're at the height of your ability? I understand going out when you want to go out. I, I completely get that I want to retire on my own terms, right? I don't want to be, you know, I, I look at Steve Young, right? He had to retire because of all of his concussions. Right. I don't, I don't think Tom Brady wants to go out retiring because of concussions. He wants to retire and still have the knees to play with his kids. You know, looking at you, Joe Namath. Right, right. Right? Like, um, but at the same time, it's Tom Brady. Like, he, he, he is football. And I also think he realized yeah. all these quarterbacks are going to the AFC. Who's yeah. left? In the NFC. I mean, Russell Wilson left. uh, And the only quarterback really we have now in the NFC, well, I guess you have the Rams quarterback. I'm like, Matt Stafford? Right, right, I'm just Super Bowl champion. Jimmy Um, G for now? (laughs) Exactly. Um, And then you have Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers scares no one during the postseason. And so I'm sure he was not scared of Aaron Rodgers one bit. So he might have a free pass to the Super Bowl this next year. I don't know. All right. That being said, it's time to the NFC championship game. I mean, he has a free pass to play the Rams again in the NFC Championship game. Right. So, so wh- why not come back? It. Yeah. There you go. All right. Well, take that's it. it for this week's edition of Debriefing the Law and Courtroom Quarterback. Have a great week. It is time to go watch some more brackets being busted. Have a great week, Chris. See you guys. 
Thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a five-star review. We need your love to help us continue highlighting the funnier side of the law. I want to give a special shout-out to our Vice President of Operations, Wendy Oster, without whom this entire operation would be a complete and utter mess. Sean Wynn and 15 Five Features for making me sound way better than I actually do. Brooke Bolin for our marketing efforts. And Ryan Kuhn and Paul Kuhn of Tri- Plus City Marketing for our technical and computer support.